odds. It is up to you to make this decision and to try to beat the odds. And this is in every life, and, and this is the most human thing if we think about it. Hope about survival, mm -hmm. about, about, you know, why do you get up in the morning? Mm -hmm. Because you think you're gonna have a better day. And I failed an exam twice and I got kicked out. And for me, I was like, oh my God, I'm one of, I'm, fa I'm a failure and ESA is never gonna take me because now I have a permanent black mark on my CV. Maybe I won't be as successful as I want to, but the fact that I do the first step to try and do it makes a massive difference. And that's the motivation is that the door is open if you decide to get up in the morning and try, even if it's not a guaranteed success, it's a guaranteed experience and that's amazing. It, on the contrary, it made us excited because we're like, it's our base, it's it's our baby, yeah. it's our mission. And look, we're working for this. We're not being babysitted yeah. and being told what to do. Yeah. Now we are taking charge because now it, it's survival mode on and mission like rescue mode on. Yeah. And that's really, really cool. Yeah. Like you are your own master and you are your own best friend and you are mm -hmm. your own leader, basically. Mm -hmm. You have to be your own example. Mm -hmm every day mm -hmm. every day and that's what's really hard but that's also what's what makes life really interesting you know it's like what kind of leader for yourself are you gonna be Welcome everyone on the Unbiased Podcast. Today, I have really the honor to have <laughs> Eleanor Polly with me. So Eleanor Polly is a PhD candidate at Cambridge University. She's also a TED Talk speaker. She's an analog astronaut, crew commander, and last but not least, among other things, she's also an Iron Woman. She already did Iron Man triathlon, right? Uh, half Iron Man. Half Iron Man. Training for the full one in six months. Perfect. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> so, so honestly, I, and we met during the TEDx, so I, I've seen your, your big talk uh, about no planet B and no self B, but that will be soon available. Hopefully, I will post the link of the, of the TEDx uh, when it's available. So first of all, really thank you very much for welcoming me <laughs> and for uh, taking the time. So the very first thing I wanted to, to discuss with you is really how, how do you manage to get motivation and to manage to achieve already so many things. So what's your core driver or, or at least one thing that you could think of? Well, first, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> um, I think when I was a, a kid, I started playing the piano really, really early and started doing sports and then started going to school and I kept doing all those activities. So I was really, really used to doing lots of stuff mm -hmm from an early age mm -hmm. and for example I was doing swimming but I didn't want to do swimming 10 hours per week so when we started to get a bit more competitive I was like actually no I still want to play tennis and go to the gym and you know play the piano so I, I learned to kind of compromise my time and not just do one thing mm -hmm. because I was always curious into all these things mm -hmm. and I wasn't always successful like I, I failed many exams and many things but compared to a lot of people who didn't even try, I was still able to do lots of things. And I just, I keep this motivation in me. And sometimes I just overload myself because I'm like, well, you know, I want to do this. And the only limiting factor is myself. Uh, sometimes it can be your sleep or sometimes it can be obviously like money. So you have to find a job to be able, enable you to do something. But in the end, I was like, well, if I want to, it is possible. Mm -hmm. And if I want to try to solve a problem with sustainability, then I will aim to do it. If I want to communicate about a problem, then I will do it. Mm -hmm. If I want to help someone, then I will do it. Maybe I won't be as successful as I want to, but the fact that I do the first step to try and do it makes a massive difference compared to the, I don't know, 90% of people who do not even try. Mm -hmm. Like right now, I'm trying to become an astronaut. And I know like the, the statistics of becoming one are really, really low. But if you don't even cross the threshold of the door to get that, then there's no way you're going to get that. And that's, I think, something that after trying and trying, even failing, but learning from this, it's the advantage I have compared to some people who just don't even dare, you know? Yeah. And that's the motivation is that the door is open if you decide to get up in the morning and try, even if it's not a guaranteed success, it's a guaranteed experience. And that's amazing. So the very first thing basically is your attitude towards failure 
Mm. Uh, at least uh, and that's something that made me think that when I meet uh, many people, students or others that I met, will not try indeed because they will s be scared of failing. And what you're saying is kind of one of the things allowing you mm -hmm. is that you, you're ready to try, and you're ready yeah. to, to fall. And, and again, this mentality or uh, do you have any things where it comes from? It's just, I don't know. So there's different things. When I was a kid, I watched uh, Welcome to Gataka or Gataka, the movie, okay. which talks about, um, you know, a science, it's a science fiction movie in the future where they say, well, you genetically engineered. Uh, so your parents kind of pick up the best oven for you and then you just um, a perfect person. And if you're not a perfect person, if you're born naturally, then you're not allowed to do any of these things. And the main protagonist is a perfect, uh, imperfect person. So he was naturally born mm -hmm. and he wants to become an astronaut and he can't. And he has to take the blood identity of a perfectly engineered man who was suicidal because he was so perfect, but yet never managed to be the best at everything. He was always beaten up and he was like, but I'm perfect, there's no reason. And it was, it was this parallel thinking, well, you can be perfect and still fade because of your expectancy, or you can be imperfect and decide to take your own fate into your hands. It is up to you to make this decision and to try to beat the odds. And this is in every life, and, and this is the most human thing if we think about it. Hope about survival, mm -hmm. about, about, you know, why do you get up in the morning? Mm -hmm. Because you think you're gonna have a better day. Otherwise you would just give up and just die and rot. So hope is in each and every one of us. And you can't take it one step further than just survival and just going to work. You can actually take it to trying to achieve your dream mm -hmm. or trying to better life for, for you, your family or mm -hmm. other people. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the things. And then again, to become an astronaut, I thought, you know, you have to be perfect. And I always thought, well, you know, you probably have to be this kind of superhero. But then my CV started to look more and more like the CV of an astronaut. It's still not there yet, but getting there. Yeah. Yeah. And then suddenly I failed my exams when I was studying at EPFL. My, my godfather fell ill, it mm. completely disturbed me. I was also working, doing my piano certificate yeah. and I failed an exam twice and I got kicked out. And for me, I was like, oh my God, I'm one of, I'm, fa I'm a failure and ESA is never gonna take me because now I have a permanent black mark on my CV. And then I read mm. astronaut Kurt Kelly's book called Endurance. And he's one of the twin astronauts that went to space and they did the twin studies and his uh, brother is also an astronaut and he, from childhood he was not a good student and then it, it's really lovely because I, I had just failed my exams so it was maybe a year later and I was on a plane and I got his book and in it he said uh, I applied to go to the school this military school where my brother was and then the chief uh, said well I'll need to queue in well for the interview because of your brother but actually there's no way you're gonna get in mm -hmm. and then he comes out and it's his only dream and so far he had no motivation in life no no direction he had finally decided to be an astronaut and suddenly they told him actually no you can't and he had tears in his eyes and you read this knowing he's an absolutely successful astronaut yeah. and then you're like okay, okay, I, I can do this. Mm -hmm. He had a black mark. Mm -hmm. He also failed. He's not perfect. Neither of them are perfect. Mm -hmm. And they're still some of the most incredible human beings I've, I've heard of, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's when I really thought, well, okay, let's get back in track, you know, let's get going. We can, we can always, always apply. And the important thing is to never give up. Sometimes you can be a bit tired, you know, but never give up. And, and I completely agree. That's also a, a big issue because with what's communicated, mm -hmm. like mostly you see the success of people and it gives a misleading idea because you like to show that people are successful, mm -hmm. what they achieved. And I've seen in, in that regard, a CV of failures of a, a famous professor. I, I, I can't remember his name. Uh, and I'm sure now something that people are doing and that was fantastic because you see like the list of rejection yes. of things that he took of grants that he never managed mm -hmm. to get of papers that end up in the trash of positions again who he was rejected and then you kind of understand okay so actually to reach this goal i have to stumble many times many and many everybody times everybody will do that yeah so that that's and 
That's very interesting with, with you. Okay. So after EPFL, you went mm -hmm. to, to Cambridge? No, so after EPFL, uh, so I was in my third year bachelor, I had almost okay. finished my bachelor oh, wow. completely. Okay. I was missing maybe 23 credits. Uh, literally, I was missing half a point on a 24 point exam to validate my, my membership. But yeah, anyway, um, I, and I, I w had already plan B and plan C. I'm the kind of person who always has plan A, plan B, plan C, even if everything goes well. It's just, you know, like I like yeah. having backups. And I had a, a, a for, well, you know, this, this school in Winterthur. Uh, Swiss Germany, where they also do material science, because in Yverdon, which is the other, uh, how you call it, uh, applied school of science, they didn't have material science, and I really enjoyed material science. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I want to keep doing this, and I like German, I love Swiss Germany, well, let's just go and learn Swiss German. I mean, yeah, it's going to be tough. And I applied, and it was really funny, because my application letter was such poor German, like apparently I was really, it sounded like I was probably a kid writing, you know, but they still took me, but they say, well, you know, the third year is quite difficult, so you need to get in the second year. And because of the German, and it was true, like the first weeks I was there, I would go to bed at five in the afternoon for two hours because it was destroying me yes. to do engineering in German. Like you have 30, 35 hours of classes per week. And the math was the easiest for me because there was no German involved, but I didn't know how to say plus, minus, <laughs> multiplied. I didn't know how to say horizontal. Like I knew I could have a conversation in German, but I couldn't do engineering, okay. you know, yeah. even for, I, I knew some words because I worked at Pilatus aircraft before, okay. like uh, in the summer just before starting. So okay. it, it gave me a head start, but I knew like maybe how to say tension, compression, but not plus minus divided. And I was like, okay. So I went there for two years, got my bachelor's there. Okay. And I was really tired and I was like, oh, actually, I've, I kind of want to do a master's because I know I want to do a bit more than the engineering. I want to be a bit more research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, but I was, I was tired of studies and I thought, well, in Switzerland's two years and a half master's mm -hmm. and it's difficult to apply, uh, where am I going to go? And then I saw that in the UK. Yeah. You did 12 months master's, so it's a 12 months long, so okay. technically yeah. it's the same, yeah. but it's compressed, right? So I applied to three schools, um, and one I applied as a joke, and it was Cambridge, <laughs> because I thought there's no way I'm going to get there, because again, permanent black mark, and, and one Sunday evening at 10 p.m. I got an email saying, oh, I just saw your application, would you like to do a PhD with me? So it wasn't even masters it was like do you want to do a PhD and I was like well I would love to but I haven't got a masters yet yeah. so they told me well you can do one year masters with us and then a PhD fully funded oh, wow. and then uh, I took That's it crazy yeah and I was okay. like what, what <laughs> that so what do you think was the key that led to that if you have something in your to share with your audience many are students many they, me hope to do a PhD mm -hmm. what was the thing so specific managed to get you there. So may, to get that, you mean what tools helped me or why did I want to do a PhD? No, but why oh. they offered you this mm. unique opportunity, I mean, to, to go on? I'm not 100% sure, but from since I was 15, I've been actually working on the side. So when I was 15, I was in high school and I was doing robotics on the side. And then we had to do robotics event uh, at EPFL. And I became a robotics assistant for my teacher. And then I became a robotics teacher for, for children. Yeah. Then I, I was always looking for jobs. And then I applied, I was working in the construction material a laboratory at EPFL, and I was a mathematics professor, and I was working in the aeronautics association. Mm -hmm. And even for my um, how say, high school diploma, I was um, working on an aircraft. So I was extremely strongly oriented towards teaching and engineering and, and math. Like I, I was very active there. Then the thesis I, would do, I was doing during my uh, my undergraduate studies at mm -hmm. both EPFL and Zidahave, where I studied later, okay. they were both also very much oriented towards the material I was then studying for my master's. And it's this, it's basically if they see that you're a very motivated Thanks. person, um, and academically, I sometimes have very good grades. Like in material science-wise, I had really good grades, but then bad grades in math and physics for, for EPFL, or yeah. not so good, just, yeah. And when I went to Zidahave, it was easier to do math and physics, and I had really, really high grades. So they, they were a bit confused. They're like, why do you get a six out of six in math at Zidahave, but you did it at EPF? I was like, well, <laughs> they're a bit different. Um, but also, it was easier because it was only numbers or you know letters, but not actual words in yeah. German. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. 
No, I, I, I perfectly, okay, I see. Mm. Because at least it speaks to me, because I've mm. been in several processes to hire people. And I always yeah. tell this as well to my students, like, if you have outstanding grades and that's it, it's a bit hard to go out or be noticed, you know, mm -hmm. you, you receive hundreds of applications and okay, so if you have to, to go through them, usually people will look at the grade first, but if it's not terrible, you can go to the next step. And then to be different, I mean, it's way more important what you said. Mm -hmm. What's unique and what's sometimes lack or is difficult to detect on a, an application is motivation. And that's everything. Yes. Because if you are like really transcendent or really motivated by what you're doing, you're going to do the work mm -hmm. most of the time. Unless there are some massive barriers or some limitations mm -hmm. for some reasons. But usually you're able to go there. And I think that's, that's a very good and strong message. And as well, a very good example that you're showing here by, by showing exactly this. And that's steps, yeah. But I have to say one thing is I also do an applied PhD. So I'm working in a lab. Yep. If I had been doing, for example, a theoretical PhD and more, for example, math oriented or physics oriented, yeah. probably they would have looked more at my grades. So that's, I mean, for engineering and, you know, obviously SDEM, there's this thing where it's not also motivation, but obviously like cognitively, if I don't have the capability, then yeah. Mm -hmm. The same as if I were to employ somebody who's never been in a lab, in a lab, and, and they tell me, oh, actually, I'm really clumsy. Either I would try and see how clumsy they are and if they can get over it, or I'd be like, actually, because this is a hazard. And it's also, yeah. for them, it would be really bad if they keep on breaking stuff and it's Perfect. demotivating and, um, so this is where, because I was like, they offered me this applied PhD. That's probably why it worked. Also, um, maybe they would have said no if it had been purely simulation or theoretical uh, work. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you don't know. Maybe, but I would also have told them probably no. <laughs> but just theory. <laughs> well, that, makes that makes sense. Indeed, yeah. you're doing theory, and you are expected just to do equations, which are closer to what you will see in the exam. Mm -hmm. it makes sense that you test on me on that. And something that's, that's really striking, is because you, you take the first example is, uh, I always forget the name of this movie, but this movie is all Gataka? about space, right? Gataka? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And also this where, because this kind of highlights everything you're saying and conveying as a message. Mm -hmm. So basically you're saying, a kind of my dream is going to space and I'm doing everything possible to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, at least that's what I understand from the message, the discussion, what I've seen on, on YouTube in your channel. And and space is like, it seems like the ultimate, even in metaphor, you say like shoot for the stars. So it seems like the, it's the hardest thing you could think of. And, and again, where I'm just interested, when did it start and, and how, how come you, you're so passionate about that? It's quite funny. So as a kid, I was always fascinated by space or like stars. I wanted to be an astrophysicist because I found that really, really interesting. Then I wanted also to be maybe mechanical engineer or environmental engineer. So always STM oriented. But for me, astronaut SDM? was, uh, sorry? STM? What, um, oh, science, technology, engineering oh, yeah. and math. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Sure. Yeah. So if you don't know, <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, that's the acronym. Um, and uh, I always thought, Wow, well, astronauts, it's just those, those kind of heroes and that's not me. I mean, I was a good student, but, you know, I, w I, w I wasn't like, you know, a, prodig a child prodigy. And I thought, well, you know, probably you need to be that kind of thing. And I didn't necessarily want to be that kind of thing. I wanted to keep on doing all the stuff I did, mm -hmm. do them well, yeah. but I didn't need to excel in any of them. I wanted to just have the time to do all of these. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, uh, I was fascinated by also submarines. So always wanted, I love those kind of extreme environments, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, and then got more and more into aircrafts. Uh, so if you go to my room, I have a massive airplane in it and I worked at Pilatus aircraft. I wanted to be a military pilot okay. in Switzerland so that I would get to fly, but not bombard people and yeah. kill them. So, you know, the kind of nice balance. <laughs> and uh, I got more into military stuff and airplanes. And then I thought, well, look, I'm applying to EPFL. Mm -hmm. I'm going to become an engineer. Um, I'm going to probably be a pilot. Uh, I love sports. I love extreme environments. I speak multiple languages and I want to speak even more of them. Mm -hmm. So it looks like I should 
apply at some point, you know, because I'm getting more and more there. And when I started, uh, when I joined EPFR, I joined Aeropoli, which was the Aeronautics and Aerospace Association that we had. Nice. And there were lots of conferences and Claude Nicolier was often there. And we also had Marc Toussaint from ESA. He was, he worked on the Iron 5 uh, rockets launchers. And yeah, you know, when you watch um, presentation where they show a liftoff of an Iron 5 rocket and the whole auditorium shakes and you, and you like, I want to be sitting on one of those things. That's <laughs> when you realize, okay, let's do it. You know, let's, let's go and try. And what's amazing is that I don't have to force myself. Mm -hmm. If you if you have to force yourself to try to see if you like sleeping in a tent in the snow, or if you have to force yourself to go for a jog because you're really not in shape, or you can't learn a new language, you already have a problem. But for me, I like going on Duolingo and say, okay, let's let's pump up my Russian again, you know? Or like tomorrow I'm like, actually Chinese sounds good. I wanna learn it. I don't have time, but let's go for it. <laughs> but for me it's 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 normal, you know, and, and and challenges is something that I live for. So it's it's it makes it easier for me. It's not easy in the way that it's it's obviously a lot of work and lots of your time goes into it, but it's wonderful because it's a path I would anyway take mm -hmm. because it's anyway stuff I want to do mm -hmm. uh, and in this I'm really really lucky uh. so it, it, something very interesting again that, that I thought while listening to, to you right now is that it seems like you're enjoying even more the process than the outcome meaning that which is very often something we say about happiness and mm -hmm. about achieving something like really it's not the destination and, and so mm -hmm. on and here it's exactly what you're saying. It's basically, I don't know if I will end up on these rockets mm -hmm. in space, but at least every step, even if it seems painful, I'm loving that. Exactly. And that's beautiful and very encouraging because if you think about a PhD, it could be very long and gruesome. And, and I, I think <laughs> I was talking with many people who were like, I'm really, really hoping to get this PhD to get this position, but I hate the PhD. Maybe they'll manage, but that's that's a long time, five years, or I don't know many years mm -hmm. for myself, it was five. And here you're, you're really showing and highlighting that, like you care about the process rather than the, the outcome, at least. It would be fantastic. <laughs> I, I would not be surprised. I have no clue about the process, but, but it's pretty impressive already now when you see all those steps. And just because we, we mentioned that several times, I had no clue before meeting you, uh, just in a very few sentences, what, uh, what's an analog astronaut? Oh. So, and, and the fact that you were a crew commander, but we can go step by step. Sure. Um, so an analog astronaut basically takes part in what we call analog space missions. And the space missions, basically, they if you go to space, you have, uh, often you think about lack of gravity, but usually in isolation, you have a restraint for you, you have a very tight, uh, what we call flight plan, so your schedule and you live you know, with the same kind of people for maybe weeks or months. And those conditions then can be to some extent recreated on Earth. And mm -hmm. that's what we do with analog space mission is that we replicate, for example, the isolation part or the experiments or the very tight schedule that you have or the team also. For example, you try to test the optimal team on Earth before you send it to space. And then you see, okay, well, these guys they don't, don't get on well because of this, this, but maybe with this other team member, that's how it could work. And so I was an analog astronaut where we were replicating basically a lunar space uh, mission or a lunar base. Uh, so we were on the ground for eight days because it, it was a short one because we, we were student led. So it's yep. like not the same budget as if you had okay. to pay. So okay. I didn't have to pay anything. It was all paid by sponsors. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, it was all made by students. So. Obviously, you're a bit more limited, but it was still extremely well done, high quality. Yeah. And we had really everything from the experiments that we had to do as you would do in space, mm -hmm. uh, the flight plan, we had literally our schedule, we had all communications with Earth also. So you like base okay. to MCC, base to MCC, do you copy, you know? And then they say, we copy, then you say, okay, could we update the flight plan, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Okay. All the food was monitored, everything, everything was like really, every detail was. Uh, Planned. <laughs> and one of the most striking thing in your talk, or one of the things that I remember from your TED talk, one of the many events where, if I'm not mistaken, like you got at some point to make a choice to use the battery of the heating system yeah. and to use that. So, so basically you manage as well. So that was really 
a surprise, right? It's not something they planned in advance to no. challenge you. So you even managed to replicate uncertainty and those kind of events. So it, just for, for the audience, if you could just summarize this event, because I, I thought it was very, again, enlightening on how you could like make decisions. At the moment, it was maybe more painful, but you try to reach your goal, mm -hmm. keeping on the mission, basically. Yeah, and especially as a crew commander, you try to keep your crew healthy and happy while keeping the mission happy. So there, in this case, what happened is it was literally from the first day on. So we, we had to plug heaters everywhere in the humidifiers because the base was 90% humidity and 13 degrees Celsius, which is okay. Mm -hmm. but you get cold, your hands are cold, and because we have to do experiments, yeah. also means that you're not into laboratory conditions, yeah. you know? Um, so we, we had plugged heaters and stuff, and also we were eating like a thousand calories more a day than we should. This means you also yeah. don't have the same food supply, right? Um, so these are all things that you have to take into account. And we were thinking, okay, well, 18 degrees should be achievable with the heaters and blah, blah. So we plugged all of them, went to bed, and then the next morning, we had to do a cleaning of the base. It was in our tasks. We have to do a checkup. We have to remove the water from the, the humidifier. Yeah. And that's when, that's when I realized some of the heaters were off. And I was like, well, this is weird. And then I tried to plug it and to plug it and to plug it, and they were off. And that's when we realized that one of the fused had blown up. Mm -hmm. So we changed it. And then again, and then wow. there was only one backup left, and that was for the science tent and experiments. And the scientific experiment had priority because we had lots of students who'd been working for this uh, for a year or even two years, and it was for the bachelor or master thesis or for other yeah, projects with the MIT. So they had priority, you know, because we could still survive. I mean, obviously, we'd be more tired and everything, but we could still survive. We could just, you know, you shoot up and then it's fine. And so this is where we actually, we did the electrical mapping of the whole base. Uh, like it took, took quite a few hours. And then we had to look at our phones and you know the dehumidifiers and the heaters, how much power they had, how much amperage they had. We had to recalculate everything. It was done by one of my astronauts. Actually, he was, he was helping with this. And then we coordinated with the base and then we say, okay, well, now we're gonna say one heater per thing and all the others we're going to put on the side so we still had a little bit of heaters yeah, yeah. but for example where i was sleeping i think it didn't go higher than 13.5 degrees uh so yeah we had to to compromise and i was kind of telling people okay eat a little bit more because we're going to run like fast through yeah, food yeah. and actually i lost three kilos in like eight eight days or something like this which is good <laughs> great diet <laughs> but obviously it's it's not sustainable like yeah. you know you have to be you have to be careful because then uh, on the long run, your body is not going to enjoy this, mm -hmm. you know. And yeah, and then we had to do lots of things like this. And what was amazing, it wasn't scary at all. Mm -hmm. And I think that was because we were all in the astronaut mindset and, you know, we were ready for this. It, on the contrary, it made us excited because we're like, it's our base, it's, it's our baby, yeah. it's our mission. And look, we're working for this. We're not being babysitted yeah. and being told what to do. Yeah. Now we are taking charge because now it, it's survival mode on and mission like rescue mode on. Yeah. And that's really, really cool. And in space, it's a bit more stressful because usually it's your CO2 levels going high up mm -hmm. or if you lose communication and maybe there's a debris going up and you can't avoid it because you yeah. don't know it's there. Yeah. It's a problem. Obviously, it doesn't have the same consequences. For us, it was enjoyable. For them, it's probably more <laughs> tense, but it's still a exactly. great challenge, you know? Yeah, and I, yeah. I can imagine with all the setup that you get really into it. Mm -hmm. Even if you know that maybe you can go out easier than you were in space, I would not be surprised that you, you get relatively close to that due to the whole setup mm -hmm. being underground, uh, no lights or anything from outside, so mm -hmm. no natural lights. What, what's, what will be the next big step to actually become an astronaut? What would you require more? Um, experience and age. So for the okay. moment I'm 26. Okay. Uh, I did not pass the selection this year and I got rejected from the CV on. So they didn't really read my motivation letter. Okay. And for me, you could think, oh, that's really infuriating, but actually not, because I'd rather be rejected because I'm too young than be rejected because I'm cognitively not good enough or mm. you know, maybe mm. there's a psychological flow. So this I will know next time I apply okay. again. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, they used to recruit only for 27 years old and above. And okay. now also they say 27, 
for years old to 50 years old. So if you compare my CV to somebody who's 50 years old and in good health, yeah. Yeah. obviously you're going to take them, right? It, make, it makes sense. I mean, you might take a mix, yeah. but I am really on the younger age. I'm barely at the three years work experience because the PhD okay. only counts as half. Okay. Uh, well, so I expected this. When they, they made the call last year, I was like, oh, it's one year too early. Literally, okay. it is one year too early. And I was like, I've been waiting for this for years. And it, it was supposed to be 2024, not 2021. <laughs> Why are you doing this? But it's, it's fine. And um, so this is going to be like just more work experience. Okay. I'm going to try to go to, uh, to do some expeditions on the Arctic and Antarctic. So that will be really stuff that is not because I've did done the analog space missions. But uh, and it, it wasn't a real extreme environment, like it was still okay. I mean, obviously, you're still underground and it's cold, mm -hmm. but it's not the Arctic or Antarctic or the desert. So, these would be the extra things I would like to do I see. I see. Uh, and preparing right now. So, I look forward to that. Uh, a bit more public speaking. So, preparing, you have a plan already or you're just physically preparing to the opportunity? Mm, so, I have a plan already with at least two separate groups. Uh, well, the, 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 for the moment, the confidentials. Okay. And it, well, one would be in 2026, uh, 2026 and one in 2027. Uh, okay. So, it's quite uh, in a few years. Um, it's still lots to prepare. And so the Iron Man is just actually <laughs> like one. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> <laughs> among, like you will be fit enough to do that anyway so let's do that wow. well I mean I think the expedition is a very different kind of fitness like for me the okay. Ironman will be really tough but it's more about you know keeping my knees working and I can always walk walk to the end you know yeah. it's it's yeah I can't do it it's more about is your body going to give up? Not necessarily something you can control, right? Uh, it's not my fault if my knees are bad. It's mom and dad's fault, you know, they had bad genes. Uh, <laughs> but um, for the expeditions, this is more, you know, uh, get your gear prepared, get your logistics prepared. Yes. And that's why it takes more time in a sense, you know, you, because you need to really have all your, I say, protocols ready. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. there you might die. The Iron Man is like, you can still die, you can still have a heart attack, but it's just, that's just bad luck, you yeah. know. Yeah, uh, yeah. But normally they, there's no problem, there's people around. But exactly. in the Arctic, you're going to be alone. So you can always <laughs> exactly. go. No, sure, sure. But you, you have this, uh, I think in endurance sports, you also have like your training physically, but also mentally. Mentally, like, yeah. Like doing the same thing for hours. So Ironman will be half, maybe five, mm. five hours. And mm. I guess five, six. Mm. You also train to like, Okay, I, it's painful, <laughs> but I'll keep going and even try to enjoy this. Um... Love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for, but the first half I did was really funny because I, I started doing triathlon, say, in January 2019. And then I was planning doing the half in September, thinking, well, I've got nine months to get ready. But then a friend of mine, uh, she got me a slot for one that was in June. Wow. And we learned that my half Ironman I was on the 2nd of June. <laughs> I learned f I had it on the 2nd of April. So I had eight weeks to get ready for my first Ironman. I didn't have a wetsuit. I didn't even have a helmet. I had never swum in a wetsuit or anything. And I, I was like, and I, you know, I was, I was training, but I went from training maybe eight hours per week to 14 hours per week. And I was, I was really stressed and I was like, people were telling me, oh, people will pull your hand in the water. <laughs> and, and I was like, oh my God, if I crash on a bike. And literally four days before I was, I was really almost shaking. And then I, I just hit myself in the face. I was like, okay, now you shut up. You're gonna do this. You're gonna enjoy this. And there's no backing <laughs> out. So, you know, sit down and do it now because we're not going out. And I arrived on the day and in the morning, and the day before I was really super excited about it. I, I stopped getting scared. I was like, you know, whatever happens, you do it and you enjoy it. And in the morning at 7 a.m., I tore, um, I sprained my ankle <laughs> going to the train. The train was canceled. I tore my bib. Uh, on the bike, I almost got the wrong path because I wasn't sure if I was got, supposed to loop there or not. Yeah. And then while running, I took some Red Bull and it went into my eyes. I got blinded for about a minute where I was like, oh my God, couldn't <laughs> see anywhere. And it was still one of the best experiences in my life. It was, it was so cool. I loved it. it yeah. Even for the results of, again, failures and mistakes, it was still like, you know what? I did this thing in eight bloody weeks. I went from zero to yeah. this. Yeah. And and yeah, it was it was really really cool. Yeah, embracing the the adversity and the, yeah. I mean it's it's kind of life, right? You, you, you it will is. 
face things that you're not expecting and not mm -hmm. willing but then it's it's really and it's really key i mean my life and what you're seeing and what i, I perceive here is really like it's not what happened to you it's rather the the look how you look at things how you happens. work on it yeah it's yeah. like how you how do you take it on are you going to laugh at that you know sometimes when you have a week where you have bad thing after bad thing happening yeah. and then as i mean you know you know i'm going to start laughing because it's just there's nothing you can do yeah. you have to just you have to keep working on it and and yeah sometimes it's sad and sometimes you have to sit down and cry a bit or punch mm -hmm. a wall mm -hmm. whatever you yeah. do you yeah. know yeah. or go around a half marathon maybe <laughs> i don't know that's yeah. maybe that's the kind of thing you do also <laughs> but yeah you have to work it out and, and and it sucks but you know you you just if you keep in a ball and you're bad you're never gonna go forward and there's not someone who's gonna be able to lift you up every time yeah. like you are your own master and you are your own best friend and you are mm -hmm. your own leader basically mm -hmm. you have to be your own example mm -hmm. every day mm -hmm. every day and that's what's really hard because that's also what's what makes life really interesting mm -hmm. you know it's like what kind of leader for yourself are you gonna be um, I, I 100% agree <laughs> with you I'm, I'm my Oh, Edda's daughter is three years old and I'm already telling her that like really your your best friend in the end mm -hmm. like you will be always there for you so and that's something even that I heard the psychologist says if you listen how you speak to yourself it's very important to detect how do you treat yourself and if already you're like always diminishing you it's it's the first thing to do before mm -hmm. looking uh, outside and I think that's that's really important to 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 think and also in in this era when we could discuss many things but i think like here you're really being responsible and the captain of and board of your life by being responsible or accepting that you're responsible for to what happens and that you are able to it's not the ex external uh, things outside that will really uh, solve every problems mm -hmm. uh, it has to start with you even if definitely i mean we need others uh, to go far. I mean, uh, my PhD is just the first thing I could think about. Like even my single author mm -hmm. article, like I've done that with a hundred people in the mm -hmm. end. It's never alone. So I think it's it's again very, very important. And and maybe we can finish actually on this message because something that's basically that's your TEDx message, really well framed that you mentioned here more or less. It's really there is no self be. Mm -hmm. I think so. So again, if you want to just reflect on that to to finish or or explain to the audience how, how you see this, uh, uh, what's your idea about that? So my idea about that is that like you are always like going to fail and you're always going to or you should always learn from it because they won't be like probably a second life or anything. It's just you and then tomorrow you and after tomorrow you and this is this could be your self be basically but it won't be outside of yourself okay mm -hmm. it's like it's up to you to evolve and to progress uh because you won't have a second chance basically or maybe you will but we don't know for sure mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so it's up to you that that you're on to your time on earth you take control of this and every time you fail, you bounce back on these things, you know, and you can always, always progress. You can do more with uh, with less and you can also always learn. Every day you can learn something and something mainly about you and how far you can push your limits. Mm -hmm. So this would be, I think, my mm -hmm. message. <laughs> and failure is a, is a fantastic teacher to, it's to evolve, beautiful. to grow. Yeah, it's it's the best slap you can get in your face. <laughs> it's, and even if you get it every day, you know, and and I think the people I admire the most are the ones that have failed the most. And mm -hmm. they still go back up mm -hmm. and, and then they're still often smiling. I mean, they're usually the most positive people are the ones who had the hardest lives in their life. Mm -hmm. And you can learn so much from people like this. Every time you complain, you say, well, you don't think necessarily like, oh, people have it worse. Mm -hmm. But think, well, yesterday I had it bad and tomorrow I will have it better because I've learned that I've done a mistake and I can, I can correct this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's my message. <laughs> I don't know. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very and inspiring encouraging i'm i'm really looking forward to sharing this with my audience <laughs> with my students who who i think really I, I can only think about them while i mean it's it's hard sometimes to find motivation a covid hit them really hard to find this motivation to grow uh, little connections some dreams that seems inaccessible and i think you're really a proof that first you can dream 
That's fantastic. You should don't always. Be <laughs> don't be afraid to fail and uh, enjoy the whole process. So, so again, Eleanor, really thank you so much for your time. That was really a great pleasure to, to have you on the podcast. Thanks to you. And really, I hope you fail a lot and learn <laughs> a lot. <laughs> May your failures be amazing. <laughs> but not, not, you know, too bad either. <laughs>